All right, everybody. The All Star Break is here for the Celtics, and there's a couple in a couple interesting articles floating floating around the interweb today. So we united the three man weave because it's been a minute. We need to get the crew back together and discuss. So you know what to do. This is Green with Envy. Let's lock in. What up, what up, what up? Welcome into another edition of Green with Envy, and today it is the three-man weave back again. Of course, this is your boy Will Weir checking in. How you doing? How you living? First up, we got my best friend, co-host, and the coach of our podcast, the one and only Greg Manakis. What's good? Fresh off a successful Valentine's Day and uh, ready, ready to talk some hoops. Let's go. Let's go. Take care of the lady. Now we take care of some hoops. And of course, joining us, our podcasting cousin from across the pond, the lead writer for Celtics blog. It's the one and only leader of the Taylor gang. It's Adam Taylor. What's poppin'? What's popping? I'm good, man. If you can see me on the screen, I'm trying to figure out the dimensions of my space because I'm trying to like throw <laughs> finger signs and like I'm being cut off everywhere. I'm like, where the fuck are my hands? The three man you weave need- signal is pretty easy, right? It's just the three. Yeah, turn it down for the M and then back up Ooh, for the W. I, I'm gonna be real with you. I had never thought of that until you just did that. Hey. See, I kind of just had it like this, like coming out, so it's weaving out of the pictures. But you're yeah. just think of like basketball. I always put up like the you know like the 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 three like three to the well, head. There's like, there's that there's that one episode where you just like threw up freaking gang signs for ten seconds. <laughs> I mean, we well, I was trying to do with the what was, what was that about? I forget what that was. That was that was tied to something. It was it was within the context, but yeah. I was like, you, God, you could man, be taken you're out. Gonna, of you're gonna, you're gonna put a hit out on us or some shit. <laughs> uh, we're, not, we're not about that life. I don't understand the gang signs anyway, but I'm like, I don't know if you know the song with the Shaka. So, so like, the we, shocker. Could, we could just throw the Shaka up there. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> I love it. I love when we get the three men. We were Speaking already down, going I'd down say. a path that uh, that we we did not have any intention of going down to, but. Uh, no, it's always fun getting the three man weave together. Appreciate everybody for tuning in here. Uh, once again, always just get it out the way here. Make sure that you are subscribing to all of our stuff, to the Celtics Chronicles, to the YouTube page, to uh, make sure you're following us on Twitter. Make sure, you know, hey, if you're on Spotify, you're on Apple Podcasts, give us five stars. Throw up a, throw up a cool review. We like to hear that stuff, and it always helps us grow the brand. So we really do appreciate that. But, you know, we're at the All-Star break right now, officially for the Celtics. We're recording this on Thursday afternoon, so there's a few more games before the NBA is completely at the All-Star break. But the Celtics right now, 43-12, and 12, the only team that will go into the NBA All-Star break, over 40 wins, uh, and right now stand to have a six-game lead over the Cleveland Cavaliers. And so with that, you know, we have a full week off, guys, where there's no games Wednesday to Wednesday, or for the Celtics, Wednesday to Wednesday. So they get a full week off. Of course, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum heading to um, Indianapolis for the All-Star game. So we'll be able to check them out this weekend. But with that, you know, there's a, this is kind of a time where there's a break and there's some different articles that start popping up around the internet because we're about to hit a sprint. As soon as we get out of this week break, it is a 28-29 game sprint directly to the finish line in the playoffs. So couple of interesting articles floating around that we want to get to and talk about. So let's start first uh, from ESPN. Tim Bontemps always puts out uh, his MVP straw poll. This is poll two of three that just came out today. So Tim Bontemps, he's also uh, heavily featured on the Brian Windhorse podcast, the Hoop Collective, I believe is what it's called. Um, so they just put out their straw poll. Got 100 different voters, most of which are the actual voters for the NBA uh, MVP award. So it is a really good temperature check as to where it's at. Here were the results and how they kind of play into you know our podcast here. Nikola Jokic currently in first place with the most votes. Shea Gilgis Alexander in second place. Following them, we have Giannis and Luka and Kawhi, all a very distant three, four, five. And then right at sixth place is our guy Jason Tatum. And Greg, I'm going to swing it over to you here. You know, if you listen to the last podcast, Greg, you kind of put it out there for people like, don't forget about Jason Tatum, because one of the usual qualifications for an MVP, best player, best team. Guess who checks those boxes? That's Jason Tatum. Greg, do you think Jason Tatum being six is, is about right for right now? Or do you think he's, at least in this context, being slept on a little bit? 
I think he's still being slept on, man. I, like, I, I really don't think it's fair that he's below some of the names that are on there, especially as the Celtics have, as you said, only team over 40 wins. They've continued to put distance between themselves and every other team in basketball. And who's the head of the snake? It's Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum in the, the last game against the Nets, you know, Jalen didn't play. Horford didn't play. Tatum's on the court. Tatum's always on the court. He doesn't sit out games like they they make him sit out games from time to time, but he doesn't want to be off the court. And I think that right there is a prerequisite to being an MVP is how available are you? And Jason Tatum is always going to be available. And then when you see like even in the Nets game last night where he didn't have a shot going. He was locked in on defense from the very beginning in that game. The the level to which he can get to on the defensive side of the ball that we've seen glimpses of, he's getting to that level consistently, and he's still able to put up the crazy numbers that he does on the offensive side of the ball. So in terms of two-way impact, I don't have all the advanced numbers on Jason Tatum's defensive metrics and all that. I just know when I watch the game, Jason Tatum is one of the most impactful defenders on the court for one of the best defensive teams in basketball. And there's not many guys that when they see Jason Tatum in front of them, even try to go by him or try to get a shot up. They don't want any problem with Jason Tatum. And when you look at a guy like Luca, who we all know Luca's great. Luca's a, an amazing player. He does not play defense. The fact that he's above Jason Tatum in the MVP poll when the Mavericks are 12 games behind the Celtics is a fucking slap in the face. So the reason <laughs> I'm laughing is because um, I wrote about this MVP stuff for the Chronicles today. Links in the, in the description. Everybody go sign up. It's free for now. Show me some love. And I didn't say it was a slap in the face, but I very rarely swear when I'm writing. It's just like, I'll be doing it more on my own stuff, obviously, but I ended one of the lines with, it's bullshit, and Tatum isn't a big enough name on the sexy name meter to really move the needle in the terms of, hey, if Luca was having to sacrifice the way Tatum is, would we be talking about Luca falling out of the MVP race? No, we wouldn't, because everyone's like, Luca, such a sexy name. Bullshit. Um, no one can win with Luca. just side note. Uh, so I think that he's being overlooked a little bit there. I also think that when you factor in wins and you factor in impact in terms of what Tatum's doing with and without the ball, as you kind of said, and I do have some impact metrics here. So I like to use EPM estimated plus minus as my impact, mainly because it factors in box scores. So it factors in players, box score data. This is it against the rest of the league. So it takes the data, it takes how good your team does with you on, with you off, regularizes it against the rest of the league, and then spits out a number that is against everybody else. So it caps out at seven, caps out at minus seven. Anywhere around that five and above is like elite and just hovering around that five. Tatum's in the 97th percentile for estimated plus minus. Is, is, is that good? Plus, yeah, yeah. I mean, Seems good. I'm just curious. For, just just want to clarify that. Plus 4.7 overall in terms of offensive and defensive metrics put together. It's not his best season. His best season was actually two years ago under MA. But when you think about the sacrifices he's made, the, the, the amount of shots he's not taking because he's distributing or the amount of shots he's not taking because he's manipulating the defense as an off-ball guy. Like we have to get to a point where we ask ourselves, are we voting MVP based on box scores and virality of highlights, or are we basing MVP on the guy that was the most valuable to his team? Maybe this is why Jason Tatum decided to wear a headband in last night's Yeah, game. headband gang. I like, <laughs> that. Luca, I like that. He saw Luca wearing the headband, and he was like, you know what? Shea's got, Shea's got a headband as well. He's in second place. You know, maybe maybe this is why I got the braids. Yeah, so you got you to have something. Braids, I mean, yeah. I mean, listen, I feel like Jokic, Tatum, Jokic, I know. Jokic got the bread pouch in his belly. <laughs> He's got the, he got the, the, the never ending red nose. He's just always has a red nose. Uh, you know, I, for me, I feel like Tatum's lineup doesn't get enough love. It, it's Jalen Rose. Top five. With how, yeah, it's just top five. That's one of, <laughs> one of the best clips out there. If you, if you watch League Pass, you know exactly what we're talking about. They play it every time. It's fantastic. But, you know, I think when I look at Tatum and, and Adam, I, I love the stats that you brought into this and you know like you said with him sacrificing there's going to be a drop off but when you look at the guys that were named that are ahead of him in this straw poll I have no problem with Jokic and, and Shea I think they're deservedly kind of at the top right now with with what they've done and how they've performed it's the Giannis Luka grouping and I think Kawhi and Tatum have very similar stats this year so I feel like they have to be on the same level and then you add in that Tatum 
Embiid's team is more is more successful thus far than Kawhi's team. Like that for me puts them what what I would deem as appropriate as kind of that three four range. But for Giannis. I'm not sure how you can be ahead of someone like Tatum, who does, Greg, to your point, feel like he gets a little disrespected in these conversations uh, from time to time. When you get your coach fired in the middle of the year, like your coach got fired, like you, you, that should automatically be like, nah, we, got, we, we can't have this happen, and especially when he's eight games back of the Celtics, eight games back. Like, And you can't use that two-way argument the same way you can with Giannis. And, and we all know Giannis is a great defender, but the Bucs are like 20th on defense right and i know that's obviously not all on him but if you're gonna put you can't really say he's a two-way guy and look at where the where, where the celtics defense is and where the bucks defense is it's miles apart you already made that case with luca their team is in the play-in and so for me it, it is always a little bit frustrating to see that tatum is always and, and greg you brought it up i feel like he gets dinged so much for that warriors finals which, yeah, it wasn't great. And I think, at least on this show, we've gone into all the reasons of what happened at that time and, and, and why that was. But I feel like it unfairly gets hung on Tatum more than it does for other stars when they have a bad performance in the playoffs. And it's just kind of lingered over him for these last year and a half or you know whatever it's been. And yet he still finds himself in the top five of MVP two years in a row. So yeah. a little disrespectful, but you know, I, I do feel like there is an opportunity for him in this stretch run to, you know, especially as we saw him drop, you know, 40 plus points the other night, you know, to him to get real hot and really propel himself into the top tier of the race. I hate to interrupt you when you're cooking because you're cooking right now, but there was a quote that came out. And I know Adam's got it pulled up here in between talking about and extolling how much he loves ass. Stephen A. Smith said something <laughs> about how much he thinks Jason Tatum is getting disrespected. So, Adam, I want you to go ahead and read that quote from Stephen A. And, and, and Adam, it. if you want to, feel, feel free to include your thoughts on voluptuous women as well, right. as mu much like Stephen A. loves to do, no matter the question. Okay, I'm going to start this with saying the Stephen A. podcast is rapidly becoming one of my favorites. Like, Dude, um, I the, the clips are so. Did you know the voluptuous woman comment that I'm referencing? The, the, the question started the off about as, the Grimes and uh, it was Kevin um, Knox, or it, yeah, Knox and Frank just, Milikina, it, it was what yeah. do you think the legacies of Kevin Knox and Frank Milikina are? <laughs> and he started talking Within about 30 deal. seconds, this mm -hmm. man started talking about his desire for voluptuous women. I don't know how he got there. <laughs> But that there's a reason Stephen A is at the top of the game, and and that's it right there, man. It's please Stephen A, keep the content coming. It's it's amazing. But Adam, yeah, back to you the actual quote. <laughs> I think now it, Stephen A used to be a guilty pleasure of mine that I wouldn't admit to. Now I openly admit that I don't think there's a personality out there I enjoy more than Stephen A. Um, okay, so the quote is, and I'm not even going to try and do the Stephen A voice, you know, where it's late here. If I start shouting like Stephen A does, I want to wake up the dog and the kid and I'll be in trouble. So I got this is Stephen A from here on out until I, I'll tip my cap when I'm done. I got Jason Tatum leading as the leading candidate for league MVP now that Embiid is out. Obviously, Embiid's missed enough games that he's no longer eligible. I'm sure, I'm sorry, does winning matter? Does being the best player on the best team matter? I say it does because voluptuous women. I'm looking at a brother that was averaging 30 last year. I don't know why he's looking at brothers. He likes voluptuous women. He's now averaging 27 and Jason Tatum that even has a teammate getting paid more than him in 300 million in Jaden Brown. He then goes on to list some stats. We can all find those stats ourselves. The brother is something special. Six, nine can take it inside, can take it outside, can take a voluptuous woman to the restaurant, to the club, can post you up, can face the basket and put up, can hit freeze, can hit free throws. The brother is a juggernaut that loves voluptuous women. He is the best player on the Boston Celtics. He is the best player on the best team in the NBA. So I'm done there. So I'm now no longer Stephen A. Taylor. Um, <laughs> what I will say is I completely agree, right? Like, again, it comes down to, are we valuing box score numbers or are we valuing winning? What, what are we classing as value here? The best player on the best team sacrificing and still putting up some career best efficiency to me is valuable. Like I see that as value. I don't care about what the box score says. Oh, well, Luke is putting up 20 points more. Yeah, but they're, they're probably not even going to make the playoffs. They didn't make the playoffs last year and Luca had a fucking amazing season. It doesn't matter to me. What matters is winning and affecting winning, and Tatum is winning, and he's affecting winning at a high level. Everyone loves – look, people are literally talking about how much they love playing with him because of how much of a playmaking leap he's taken. Dude can see over the floor. 
Eddie House yesterday in the Brooklyn Nets game when Chris Stapps was on the floor was like, people forget Tatum's the second tallest guy on the floor. He can see over the defense just as much as KP can. He's making reads left, right, and center. No, Jason Tatum should be at least a top three MVP candidate. And I don't mind if he doesn't get it. I mind if he's disrespected to be out of the fucking top five. Yeah. But what are we doing here? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of where we all land is that, you know, and there's opportunity. That's that's kind of my my parting take with this is that there's opportunity for Tatum to finish this season strong and get himself. I think it will be a lot to get up to the SGA Jokic range, but I do expect him, even if he doesn't win it, to crack that top five for a third straight season, which is pretty ridiculous when you really think about it uh, and, and really make a run at that two three spot and you know if you're in that range that there's no reason that potentially he can't make a run all the way to that mvp but with that i want to transition us to the other article that came out on the ringer.com today from what's called friend of the show howard beck he's been on the show one time it's a friend of the show friend of the show howard beck kind of um you know took an article and and basically started to look at now that we're past the trade deadline what's the next you know scuttlebutt that you're going to see across the nba especially when we hit next year's off season and when he got to the celtics it was interesting to know and it's a lot of things that we've talked about here they're obviously right now the best team in the league as far as record goes looking like they're a strong strong chance they're going to be not just the one seed in the east but they obviously have the inside track in the one seed across the nba all the way through the nba final so while obviously no moves are necessarily needed in the short term this kind of looks at the long term like is there going to be too many guys that they can't fit them all on this celtics roster and there's going to be some tough decisions this upcoming year with jalen brown's Supermax kicking in. Tatum will sign his own Supermax this upcoming summer. There's going to be decisions for Drew Holiday, who has a player option. Do they sign him to an extension? Does he opt in and they move? Drew Holiday forward? does not have a player option. It's not a player option. Is it common what is misconception? It? Drew Holiday has another Please year. On his deal. Uh, it just has another year. Like Drew Holiday's contract. Okay. It's Derek White with the player option. A lot of okay, I, saw, um, I saw Keith Smith put it out earlier today, which is why it's fresh on my mind. Uh, a lot of podcasts, a lot of people are saying that Drew's got the player option. He doesn't. He's got another year. It's Derek with a player option. I just want and like yeah. that. It's a common misconception across everybody. I didn't even notice it. Just happened to cross my Twitter feed about an hour ago, so it's still fresh in my mind. No, I appreciate that. And and, and the point overall is that the Celtics are going to get really, really expensive here with those main five guys. And so one of the parts of uh, Howard Beck's article that it talks about is that's probably not next summer, but the summer after that there's a good chance that a lot of people are kind of eyeing where Jalen Brown is at and what type of return the Celtics might want to get from a Jalen Brown contract, trying to maybe extend Derek White or Drew Holiday on cheaper deals and then try to replace Jalen with a Kevin Durant-like deal was what was proposed, which, of course, that was Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, and then a bunch of picks that came back to the Nets. Obviously, we don't want to dwell on this too much because I want to also enjoy where the Celtics are at. But Adam, I'll start with you. What what were your thoughts kind of reading this as, you know, Howard Beck highlighted what we've talked about a bunch on this show that I feel like this is a two-year window for this team to get a championship and they're going to pay the luxury tax over these next two years pretty steeply. But if they don't win, I expect there to be changes. And this article actually even insinuates, even with a championship, there could be some dramatic roster changes over the next year and a half to two years for this team. That's kind of where my head was at when the deal got signed. I remember having the conversation with you guys like, if they win, I feel like Brown is more likely to ask out than he would be if they didn't win. I feel like if they win a chip, if they win two chips, he knows the team's getting more expensive. He, I've always seen him as kind of landing with the Hawks eventually. And Atlanta, if you read all the scuttlebutt surrounding Atlanta right now, they've got some decisions to make around Trey Young. They're not sure they want to keep him or move on from him. San Antonio are looking at Trey Young. If they move on from Trey, they're going to be biding their time for a star to become available. Brown could be that guy. So, but overall, I think, yeah, Brown eventually, I feel like we all knew that he most likely wouldn't finish that contract in Boston. Not because he's not good enough to, but because two Supermax guys with the new CBA, it's really hard to build a contending team around that to the level that we're seeing Boston right now. And there's going to be other teams around the league that take a two year hiatus from being like, you know, a a cap savvy team to go all in like Boston have, but it's not sustainable long term unless you've got like Warriors money where like the luxury tax is just who cares. 
or you're the Clippers with like the richest owner in the world that could buy the galaxy four times over and still have money. But unless you're one of those fortunate like select few, it's going to be calculated risks over a calculated period of time before you have to hit that reset button. And unfortunately for Brown, if you have to choose between the two of them, you do choose Tatum because of the the all round game. Brown's definitely improved this year. He's shown playmaking flashes. He he's been playing in that play finisher role that I've been asking for for years, and he's thriving. Um, but at the same time, I do think you always lean into Tatum more just because of the player he is. So, yeah, I've kind of accepted that Brown doesn't finish his deal in Boston. If he does, great. If he doesn't, a, a Kevin Durant type return seems really fucking fair to me. Yeah, I'm not going to um, go any deeper than Adam just went. Uh, pause. Um, but I do, <laughs> I, do think, I do think that the um, Kevin Durant <laughs> pause the, the Kevin Durant type of deal is what I want to focus on here because I don't I really don't want to talk about Jalen Brown leaving the Celtics. Like let's focus on the here and now. I know the article came out, so that's why we're talking about it. I just don't want to even like entertain those conversations. To me, it's just like now we're starting to see the value that Jalen Brown has around the rest of the league. And people are talking about him for a Kevin Durant like package coming back. And I do think that that's what we should focus on here is that Jalen Brown is now being looked at as worth the money. And it's not going to be a contract you're going to have to get off of. It's a contract that people are going to willingly trade for. Yeah. And I think part of that is, you know, and this is something I think we said at the time, like, yes, it's shock value right now, over 300 million for Jalen Brown. By the time we get to not this offseason, but the following offseason, which is when this article is suggesting potentially the Celtics might move Jalen Brown for that Kevin Durant like package, he's probably going to be like the 10th, 11th highest guy paid guy in the league, right? Like there's going to be a bunch more of these $300 million deals coming in. So just like how we view the, you know, current $20 million deal, the new, the, the new $20 million deal is going to be a $30 million deal and so on and so forth, right? Like there's going to be a realignment of what those values are. And so come two years from now, Jalen Brown's probably going to slot in somewhere in the eighth to 15th highest, you know, contract per season. And that's going to feel about right, right? It's going to, it's going to be like his typical market value. And to your point, Greg, like it, that, this is why I was never concerned about him signing this deal. When people were like, I don't know, man, it's like, listen, He's, you know, in, in Howard Beck points this out, he's eight years younger than the return that that the, that the um, uh, that the Nets got for Kevin Durant. Right. So that's also a factor. Like, is he on Kevin Durant's level? No, but he also is going to have five, six, seven more years of longevity than what you get out of making that trade for Kevin Durant. So it, it, it's not necessarily the topic that I really want to, like you, Greg, get it too much into right now. But I do think it will become an interesting conversation for how do we extend the longevity of where this team has been constantly in NBA finals contention over the last, you know, four years or so and, and really extend that out. But I do think there will be a heavy emphasis, obviously on what happens this year and next year with winning a championship as to how much this core gets shook up. But I do think that this core specifically the top six of the rotation is pretty firmly locked in for the next two years, this year and next year, I'd be shocked if in the off season, anyone in that top six, unless some type of opportunity that obviously we just cannot fathom right now presents itself. I feel like this is the core in the playoffs will tell us all right. That's one thing we always learn every single year. The playoffs will tell us what will and won't happen because that's going to make franchises decide to make big moves or stay put, or that will dictate the future of what happens. But I think it's fun to talk about, but I think that's more off season fodder than it really is for right now so let's leave it where it is here and uh any other final thoughts you guys have here before we send it over to the second half of our podcast free man weave boom there it is the new symbol we out here three man weave and uh for those of you listening here on youtube uh if you want to hear the second half of the podcast it's already up just go to our green with envy quick hits on the youtube page and you will hear myself and adam taylor talk about Buyout target numero dos, Otto Porter Jr. How would he do as a Celtic? On Twitter, getting some pretty good reviews right now, Adam. feel like a lot of people have been into Otto Porter Jr. as a suggestion. And for those of you in the audio, don't move a muscle. Don't go anywhere. Coming up next, it's me, it's Adam, and we're going to speak some words about Otto Porter Jr. Stay tuned. We love you. <laughs>